All right, well, thank you, uh, Clint. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with uh, energy engineers. I have to say that the words energy engineers immediately reminds me of my past, uh, not so distant past at MIT, uh, where there was a few engineers. Uh, and uh, you may know that the, um, uh, you know, the mascot of uh, MIT is a beaver, uh, nature's engineer, uh, builds lots of infrastructure. In that case, not always desirable infrastructure, but, uh, uh, but uh, uh, certainly uh, it's, it indicates the kind of challenge, one of the challenges that we have in the energy sector, certainly in this country, and I know in, in many others as well, in terms of uh, um, an enormous need for uh, focusing and, and rebuilding uh, our, uh, our, our infrastructure. In fact, uh, uh, very, we've had a lot of impacts, of course, from things like storms, but just recently you may have been following the uh, things like the Colonial Pipeline uh, and the vulnerability to old infrastructure and what that's done. So anyway, a little bit of an aside, but again, energy engineers is something uh, dear to my heart given my 40 years at, uh, at, uh, at MIT. Uh, I might say also that um, uh, at MIT uh, in the last decade, I, I established something called the MIT Energy Initiative and, and of course engineers, the engineering school was uh, very much uh, at the center uh, of, of what became a very, very large enterprise. But what I want to emphasize as well, we also saw the uh, critical role of the engineers interacting uh, with many other disciplines, uh, the business school, for example, uh, but also uh, architecture and uh, humanities and uh, many places. So anyway, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, again, it uh, takes me back to my, uh, my uh, academic uh, life. Um, the, uh, in, in these few minutes, uh, I'm going to start with some broad comments about uh, actually very recent events uh, in uh, climate, uh, climate change, clean energy, uh, energy efficiency. They all, uh, they all come together. Uh, and then I'll come back and say more about the built environment and, and, uh, and energy efficiency. But just to say the... Um, some of the recent events, you may have been too busy in this meeting uh, to have followed. Uh, for example, yesterday uh, in uh, New York City, a uh, uh, couple of things, a couple of big things happened really. One was uh, now we have 60 countries uh, that have joined uh, the Paris Accord on climate change. Uh, that's a big deal because one of the two triggers for the climate agreement coming into force is that 55 or more countries uh, join. So, so we're past uh, that, uh, that trigger. Uh, we're still hoping. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> uh, we're still hoping to get uh, past the second trigger this year. Uh, and that trigger is that the countries who have joined represent uh, at least 55% of global emissions. Uh, we're now at about 48%, so we need a, a few more good-sized countries uh, to, come, uh, to come in. Uh, certainly, if, if the countries that have announced their intention uh, to join this year, uh, then we'll, we'll, get, we'll get over that uh, finish line as well, uh, and, the, and the agreement will come into effect. So that's, that's really, really uh, I, well, I think, a pretty, pretty big deal. There was a second set of activities yesterday in New York City, uh, uh, which certainly satisfied my definition of a big deal, uh, and that was around the air conditioning, the global air conditioning uh, challenge. Uh, the, uh, some of you may know that, of course, the, the Montreal Protocol uh, from the 80s uh, has been one of the most extraordinarily successful uh, environmental agreements, certainly in terms of achieving its objective, which was the phase out of, of uh, CFCs uh, in order to address the ozone hole. And, and you, I'm sure you all know the ozone hole, in fact, is healing. Uh, so that's, that's being accomplished. Uh, unfortunately, there was the unintended consequence uh, that the replacement HFCs, hydrofluorocarbons, uh, have a uh, great, they're great for the ozone, but they're not so good for climate change. Uh, uh, HFCs can be thousands of times Th thousands of times more um, uh, heat forcing, if you like, uh, than, than CO2. So now there's a major effort to, uh, next month uh, in a meeting in Rwanda, 
to uh, get an amendment to the Montreal Protocol that will also start uh, the phase out of hydrofluorocarbons. Uh, and to give you an idea of the scale, the uh, un unattended to this issue, given the projection of enormous increases in air conditioning uh, across the world, uh, that this alone would contribute an additional half degree centigrade global temperature rise. So this is a very, very big deal. Uh, and yesterday in New York, uh, over 100 countries uh, came together formally to endorse an amendment that is ambitious, uh, meaning that the uh, stabilization first and then phase out of HFCs would start early in 2021. Uh, that remains an area of contention, but uh, again, a very large number of countries came forward to support that. And then a second uh, rather extraordinary uh, action was that a number, of, a number of countries, but more importantly, a uh, uh, grouping of phil uh, philanthropic organizations and individuals came together to put $80 million on the table, two-thirds of it coming from the philanthropists, uh, to accelerate energy efficiency gains in air conditioning as a complement to the HFC phase-out with the condition that the HFC amendment endorses early action. So, but to get a bunch of philanthropists coming together and putting $53 million on the table is really uh, quite something. So it was a big day uh, yesterday uh, in, uh, uh, in New York. Uh, uh, in addition, the Department of Energy, with good engineering, uh, published a report yesterday that uh, came out of our Oak Ridge Laboratory, which was testing uh, alternative refrigerants to HFCs uh, for rooftop air conditioners. That's very important. A place like Saudi Arabia, for example, that would be the dominant technology uh, put out there. And the good news, and, and uh, with a international supervisory group uh, uh, guiding the protocols uh, for the testing, and the good news is that uh, there certainly appear to be uh, very effective uh, uh, replacements uh, for the HFCs without the greenhouse gas uh, um, uh, problems. Uh, so anyway, we're moving on many fronts. In fact, the last thing I'll mention is in addition, we will uh, partner, uh, we've, had we've had extensive discussions to partner with countries like Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, uh, India, China, uh, in terms of not only looking for new refrigerants, but actually looking for entirely new thermodynamic cycles. I think that's a word I can use with engineers. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, uh, so there's a lot happening, and, and I think this is really, really very, uh, uh, very exciting and very, very consequential. In terms of uh, this last, uh, these last days and, and weeks, uh, actually, some other things have, have, uh, have happened. One is uh, internal to the Department of Energy, but uh, I'll mention it uh, in any case uh, because of the, energy, the strong energy efficiency theme is that uh, the person who heads our collection of efficiency programs named Kathleen Hogan, I don't know, I assume she's not here, but is, if she is, stand up and yell. Uh, the um, Kathleen uh, received uh, what is generally called the Oscar uh, uh, for career government service. And so what's interesting is what was recognized was a career in promoting energy efficiency uh, um, across the entire, in, across the entire uh, uh, U.S. government. So that was, again, very, very exciting. And I know some of the people who work with uh, Kathy at DUE are here, and so pass on the message that everybody's happy uh, about that. Uh, so that was also uh, exciting. And, and I'll just say that in, in terms of our energy efficiency agenda, uh, more, uh, uh, more broadly, uh, oh, and then, I'm sorry, another thing happened <laughs> yesterday. Um, uh, I have a high-level advisory board uh, called the Secretary of Energy Advisory Board, CAB, and yesterday they uh, approved a major report looking at uh, how we can uh, perhaps dramatically change and improve 
federal energy management programs with the idea that they can help scale out into the broader, broader society. <clears throat> I, would, I would recommend their report. It's, it's on our website. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> they have some interesting suggestions, such as moving towards novel uh, footprint reduction, building footprint reduction uh, uh, performance contracts, uh, et cetera. And, uh, and, and I think you all know, and probably a lot of you are engaged with that, how do you manage your, your footprint and therefore your energy footprint? I'll just give one example. In our complex, uh, we have a, uh, a, a complex in Kansas City uh, that's part of our weapons uh, program, but the point here is that uh, moving from a very old facility and designing a new facility where manufacturing processes uh, could be uh, updated, not just, uh, not just the, the footprint reduction, but the footprint was, redu was reduced by, uh, by a factor of two. Uh, the manufacturing process is, uh, 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 is improved and the operating costs are $100 million a year less. So, so these are the kinds of things that, that we want to, we want to keep, keep pushing. And I know a lot of you have, have similar, similar challenges. So going to the broader comments on, anyway, a lot has a lot, so lots happened uh, in, in, the, in these days. Um, going to the broader comments about energy efficiency, uh, energy productivity. Uh, first, let me say that uh, this administration, uh, President Obama, um, uh, uh, the entire administration, certainly the Department of Energy, have been very, very focused on energy efficiency in many ways. Uh, and uh, I certainly have stated con consistently that uh, I have never seen a credible solution to the climate challenge uh, without uh, addressing the demand side uh, of the equation. So it's really, really quite central. We address this in many ways. I won't spend a lot of time. Uh, other than in the, uh, in the buildings uh, uh, space, but in transportation, for example, uh, just again this week I was at Ford uh, looking at their new uh, F-150 uh, plant, aluminum body, 700 pounds taken out, EcoBoost engines, great for, for fuel efficiency. Last week we had parked at DOE, one of our, one of our super truck partners. Uh, this was Volvo last week. We have four different partners. Class 8 truck, 88% improvement in fuel efficiency since, uh, since, since 2009. Uh, industry, of course, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, initiatives. I would just say that we have in the last five years or so had a tremendous increase in our focus on next generation manufacturing. It's part of our energy efficiency. Uh, program uh, on things like appliances. The Department of Energy is responsible for uh, setting efficiency standards for appliances and a lot of equipment. Uh, with the, uh, we have picked up the pace on that dramatically. These things add up with the efficiency standards, the 60 or so efficiency standards that we will have set. The cumulative savings to 2030 uh, are projected uh, to be over half a trillion dollars uh, of energy cost savings in the United States and uh, nearly three billion tons of CO2 avoided uh, from, now, from now to 2030. So again, there's a big, big focus. The impacts are enormous. I know this audience is quite, uh, is quite, quite familiar with that. So let me just turn now to uh, to say in more detail, give an update about uh, our Better Buildings uh, program, Better Buildings Challenge, and the Better Plants Challenge uh, that is really, really part of that. Uh, again, you know, we all know, uh, certainly in the United States, and it's true worldwide, uh, that, uh, that energy is a big budget item for many businesses, certainly lots of energy intensive uh, industries. The industrial sector in this country spends about $200 billion a year uh, on, uh, on energy. And so in 2009, the department uh, partnered uh, with leading industrial plants and water utilities uh, through this Better Plants uh, program, which is a sponsor of this year's uh, World Energy uh, uh, Energy Engineering Congress. And I should also, by the way, I, I failed, I should have thanked also Tom Stricker, 
uh, with whom I've met many times uh, from Toyota, who is uh, hosting this, uh, this, uh, this, this meeting. Uh, so Better Plants, it's, it's a voluntary leadership program for U.S. industry. Uh, companies uh, set a long-term energy efficiency target. Uh, they report their progress. They receive national recognition uh, and technical assistance uh, like uh, tracking energy performance, identifying best practices, uh, connecting companies with other resources offered by uh, uh, the DOE uh, or other federal agencies, hook up with state and local programs. Uh, uh, so it's really kind of a convening and, and branding opportunity around ambitious, uh, ambitious goals. There are 179 uh, Better Plants uh, partners, uh, and they account for over 11 percent of U.S. Uh, manufacturing uh, energy consumption, uh, with about 2,500 facilities all over the all over the country. The um, uh, the cumulative energy savings so far in the program is is uh, is uh, over 600 trillion uh, BTU uh, and more than. $3 billion. And this year, what we find exciting is that just this year, uh, 30 industrial organizations joined Better Plants, uh, which is actually the biggest, uh, biggest number in any year since the program began. So uh, we think it's going, going quite well and being, being material. And by the way, if there are companies here that have not joined, uh, feel, f feel free to uh, collar one of our people here or go to energy.gov and, uh, and, and look, at, look at the opportunities. Uh, this year, 10 of the partners uh, met their goal uh, on energy intensity, uh, uh, made specifically to reduce energy intensity uh, by 25 percent uh, uh, within a decade. And as I said, 10, 10 of the partners uh, reached that goal uh, this year. Uh, two examples, uh, Nissan um, uh, worked to uh, determine, with, worked with other co companies to determine how best to set investment criteria, criteria for their energy efficiency uh, projects um, uh, and, and then met their, uh, met their goal. Uh, they implemented uh, uh, over two and a half million dollars worth of energy efficiency projects and saved over two million dollars with that, with that investment in a relatively short time. Second example, uh, graphic uh, packaging of Atlanta. It's one of the world's largest manufacturers of consumer product uh, packaging, and they achieved uh, their, uh, their goal a year ahead of schedule, reducing energy intensity 26 percent in nine years. Uh, that included, you know, making their boiler system more efficient, converting their mill in Macon, Georgia to 100 percent biomass, uh, using a heat recovery system uh, in their Santa Clara, California uh, mill uh, to help heat their, heat their water. So th those are just two examples, and it's a very broad program with lots and lots of different uh, different, uh, different examples. Uh, the commercial and industrial sectors account for more than 25 percent of public water supply use, uh, so water efficiency, uh, which, is direct, which is closely connected to energy efficiency, is also something where we have increased our, uh, our, our focus. Uh, and uh, in fact, last year, uh, we put out a major uh, report uh, on the water energy nexus. Uh, and it's an increasing focus broadly, uh, as well as in the Better Plants uh, program. Uh, so uh, again, we, we launched an initiative uh, to set water savings goals in addition to energy efficiency targets. And to date, uh, eight manufacturers, uh, plus some from other sectors, have joined this Better Buildings water savings uh, initiative. Two partners, Cummins and UTC, met those goals uh, uh, this year. Uh, and very importantly, part of the program is sharing best practices uh, with others. So, uh, for example, UTC uh, has allowed us to uh, share its tools and an internal guidance document. Uh, Harbeck has shared details of their rainwater collection system. So again, trying to get these practices propagated across, uh, across industry. We are also working in the Better Plants, to, Better Plants program to uh, help manufacturers in their supply chains. Uh, I think, as you know, up to 60 percent, a typical number, let's say, of a manufacturing company's energy and carbon footprint can reside upstream with their suppliers. Uh, and so we work to uh, extend many of the benefits of the program uh, uh, upstream uh, to, their, uh, to their suppliers 
for example, including priority uh, uh, no-cost uh, energy audits by DOE's industrial assessment centers, which are actually 24 university-based centers uh, across, across the countries. And we think in addition to the water and energy savings uh, and emission savings, this can also help companies in, with their uh, building even better relationships, closer relationships uh, with, their, uh, with their supply chains. So there's a, there's a lot going on. Um, we, uh, we have a Better Buildings Solution Center, uh, with, uh, which uh, uh, makes available more than, more than 400 replicable solutions for deep energy savings uh, in uh, industrial uh, uh, buildings and across broad portfolios. We also have nine active Better Buildings accelerators, which are shorter term initiatives designed to demonstrate specific policies and approaches to increase investment in energy, in energy efficiency, uh, as, as well as looking into uh, things like wastewater treatment plants for, for energy efficiency. So um, again, uh, very, very active uh, uh, area for us to, uh, to, uh, uh, to pursue. Uh, and uh, and uh, this is all available, and, and we, we hope that many of you could, could look into this. I just want to say that when, when President Obama uh, announced the, uh, launched the Better Buildings Initiative, uh, he said, and I'll quote, upgrading the energy efficiency of America's buildings is one of the fastest, easiest, and cheapest ways to save money, cut down on harmful pollution, and create good jobs right now. Uh, and, and now, in fact, in the Better Buildings Challenge, we are now up over 4 billion square feet uh, uh, under, uh, under the program, uh, again, uh, with, um, with goals of typically 20% reductions in less than a decade, and many, uh, many of the companies already exceeding their goals. Lastly, I want to highlight DOE's efforts last year to work with organizations to develop and publish the Better Buildings Workforce Guidelines. And I'm just pleased to note that the Association of Energy Engineers own certified energy manager certification program is the first commercial building certification program to be recognized uh, under the Better Buildings Workforce Guidelines. Uh, and that's great. Many, uh, many others are in the process of being accredited, but I really want to recognize and thank the, I think that the, the adjective is legendary Al Thuman uh, and his team uh, for their efforts here. There he is, right there at the, at the table. That's really great. Thank you, Al. Yeah. And I'm going to end uh, by, again, staying on this theme of, of energy jobs. Uh, at the department um, a couple of years ago, two and a half years ago, we really increased our focus uh, on energy jobs uh, creating, creating energy jobs. We created a job strategy council specifically for this under the leadership of uh, Dave Foster, uh, who some of you may know or remember as the founding executive director of the Blue Green Alliance. Uh, and uh, a part, of the, a part of the task, uh, not surprising, is to first understand what, what are energy jobs. They don't, they don't they don't align with any standard categorization of jobs. So we had to try to define uh, what energy jobs were. In some cases, it's not so hard, uh, like how many full-time jobs are there in the solar industry in the United States? The answer, by the way, is 208,000 uh, as, uh, as of this, uh, this spring, so, which is a quite, a, quite a substantial amount. But if I come to this audience, and ask, what's an energy efficiency job? That's not so easy to define. Uh, we tried. You can go on the website and find what the algorithm is. You may like it, you may not like it. But whatever the case, uh, the answer to us was stunning. 1.9 million energy efficiency jobs in the United States. Now again, you can, you can broaden the definition, narrow the definition, but it's not going to change the fact this is a big deal. Uh, and it's also, mm -hmm. and it's also 
uh, kind of like the fastest growing. Their projection was another quarter million within a year. And I think that many of you in this room are responsible for that. It's doing those energy projects in the companies, uh, focusing on energy efficiency, that are creating these jobs. They may be, the Department of Labor might call them construction jobs, but they're fundamentally energy efficiency jobs. So, so this is a very, very big deal. It's a big deal for the companies. Again, save, save energy, save costs, save emissions, create jobs, and uh, that's a pretty, pretty winning, uh, winning formula. So thank you for your leadership in these areas. Uh, uh, you're having a big impact not only on your, on your companies, but on the, on the economy as a whole, and certainly on the environment. So thank you very much. Thank you.